Um, before I introduce the speaker, uh, if you actually have missed out on any of the previous um, talks, and please make sure you go to the YouTube page of IC Impacts. Um, we no longer have 39 subscribers, so the numbers are going up, uh, but uh, make sure you um, catch the previous talks on there. And finally, it, it's my great pleasure to actually introduce the speaker for today. Um, Dr. Mohammad Atea is a research associate at the Department of Chemistry at Northwestern University. His research focuses on uh, the development of new materials and techniques to absorb or degrade emerging water pollutants, such as PFAS, DBPs, disinfection byproducts, et cetera, uh, as well as the mobility of new classes of contaminants in the environment, such as microplastics. Prior to joining Northwestern, uh, Dr. Atea studied in Tokyo Institute of Technology, Japan, and the University of Copenhagen, um, Denmark. He then completed a postdoctoral training at Clemson University, and uh, he has won several awards, uh, including the 2019 Clemson University Distinguished Postdoctoral Award, the Kikawa Yamaguchi Best PhD Dissertation Award, uh, and the first place prize at the Honda Young Engineers Scientists. So um, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Atea now. Um, but before that, I just wanted to mention that if you have any questions, please leave them in the chat box and we will get uh, to them at the end of the session when uh, we have the question session. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, I'll share my screen now. Okay. Now you see kids. Now hopefully you see slides. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, thanks again for the introduction. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to uh, be able to share my work to you today. Uh, of course, I wish uh, we could all meet in person, but hopefully things will get better soon. Um, as introduced, I'm Mohammad Atea. I go by Moha. Uh, I'm an environmental engineer by training, but currently I'm a research associate at the Department of Chemistry at Northwestern University. And my research interest is to develop new water treatment technologies uh, by leveraging my knowledge of both water chemistry and materials chemistry. So I will take this opportunity today to share uh, some highlights on the PFAS uh, research that I have done over the past few years. And the goal is to give you an idea about the generality of the challenges that we are facing uh, and also the opportunities that we can take uh, as researchers and practitioners. So most of the talk, uh, as in the title said, like it will be focused mostly on the, uh, the, uh, the theme of absorption. Okay, okay, so emerging contaminants, uh, including like pesticides, pharmaceuticals, uh, disinfection byproducts, uh, PFAS, perfluoroalkyl substances, and many others. Um, and these like structurally diverse chemicals are problematic because of their increasing contaminants, uh, con concentrations in our uh, water sources, and they are persistent and toxic. So the magnitude of the problem actually is very huge, um, like given that we have 100,000 chemicals are registered in Europe, 80,000 in the US, more than half of these chemicals are already in the market. So everyone would agree uh, that there is no silver bullet here, which mean like both innovative and traditional uh, solutions need to be combined to tackle such uh, problems that we are facing. So over the past few years, I did a lot of uh, water treatment research at Tokyo Tech, Copenhagen, and then Clemson, and currently at Northwestern University. And the research goal uh, has been always to develop and evaluate next generation uh, physical chemical water treatment solutions. The major uh, efforts were in adsorption, photocatalysis, linking them to develop self cleaning absorbents. I also work on membrane, electroactive membrane, and the target here is to have like high flux and anti fouling uh, uh, membranes with anti fouling properties. And I tested these uh, technologies on a wide range of emerging contaminants, including PFAS, uh, pharmaceuticals, pesticide, disinfection, and, and the disinfection byproducts research. And recently, I'm also actively working in the topic of microplastics. But today, I will explain mainly uh, these two items it's PFAS and adsorption. So today's talk will have like four main elements. I will introduce PFAS as a general introduction for people who are not very familiar with the topic. Uh, what are the conventional absorbents that are being used, in, uh, used now to tackle this problem? And I mean functionalized uh, absorbents as promising solution uh, for, for, for this uh, issue. 
And I will end by giving you some, uh, my thoughts on like the research needs and future steps that we should take. So PFAS, perfluoroalkyl substances is a large family of chemicals that uh, are being used in many, many consumer products. Uh, that's why they have several pathways uh, to get into our water sources and eventually uh, to our bodies. So when I was in Japan, PFAS was not that a major issue uh, for them. Uh, but since I moved to the US, I saw how much focus it got over the past few years uh, in the US and Europe. So I decided to ride the wave and try to contribute in finding a solution for, for this problem. So to visually uh, show you the, the, the magnitude of this problem in, in the US specifically, so this organization, the EWG, they have a website that you can visually see the distribution and the spread of PFAS contamination throughout the, the US. Let me get the laser pointer here. Uh, okay, so uh, on the website, it's very interactive. So if you choose like military sites, it will show you where are the known now military sites uh, that they are spreading PFAS as point sources. Uh, drinking water uh, supplies that they have been tested positive for PFAS. So you can see like a lot of clusters, like a lot of points in places like New Jersey and Michigan. But the thing that I want to highlight here that these places, yeah, there are no much dots, but this doesn't mean that they don't have PFAS. It's another issue of the PFAS research that there is no much comprehensive monitoring work. So the should have and might have uh, PFAS contamination, but no one detected uh, yet. So the good thing about uh, that, that resource that if you click on any dots uh, shown there, it will tell you the, where it is and what kind of like which PFAS compound were uh, found there, the concentration and the time that it, the samples were collected. So these data were first published after peer review uh, last October. And the, the study suggested that the PFAS contamination uh, is affecting more than 250 million Americans. Uh, so one key observation, if we are talking about treatability work that we want to solve this issue, uh, that most of the, the, the concentration that were observed is in the low scale, like one to tens uh, nanogram per liter. So anyone doing water treatment like that low concentration means uh, it would be much more challenging uh, to remove it, especially if you have high concentration of organic matter or other background constituents in, 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 in your water. So the major issues with, with PFAS, uh, either to remove them or degrade them, that now we have over 8,000 8, uh, chemicals in the market, fluorinated chemicals. Uh, they are very highly water soluble. Um, as I showed you in the previous slide, they exist in a low concentration in, in most cases uh, when compared to other background constituents. And if you think about destroying them, then you will be facing the carbon fluorine bond, which is the shortest and strongest uh, in nature. So people have explored many methods, uh, either to separate uh, PFAS from water or to destroy them. So separation methods, including like activated carbon, ion exchange resins, new polymers, um, RO and nanofiltration, foam fractionation has been tested to some extent, I guess in Australia, now it's going even to large scale and electrocoagulation. This, if you want to separate it, but for degradation of PFAS, people, are heavily relying on incineration. It has a lot of problems, but this is what people are using now. But alternatively, in the labs all over the, uh, all over the world, people are uh, exploring in a, in a research scale like uh, electrochemical oxidation, activated persulfate, sonolysis, uh, photocatalysis, plasma, and recently also using enzymes or uh, biological degradation method is, is, be, is taking and the spotlight recently. So if we think about how to evaluate this material, uh, these technologies for PFAS removal, then one would be thinking about how feasible to use this technology and 
uh, are we talking about a technology that is still in the lab or a technology that it is it can be scaled up and used uh, readily so you will realize that different technology will be put or be placed in different uh, uh, location on, on on this graph uh, but the thing that will be always uh, there that activated carbon and ion exchange resins are the most uh mostly used technologies currently and our talk today will be highlighting the new polymers that they are trying to catch up with these uh, adsorption techniques so let's have a look uh, a closer look on our target here so this is a pfoa a model pfas uh, so it would have a hydrophobic tail and an ionized head so this makes them very highly water soluble and also suggests different removal uh, mechanisms depending on the adsorbent that you are using. So in activated carbon, hydrophobic interactions will be more dominant while I, I, uh, electrostatic interaction uh, will be dominant in the ion uh, exchange resin case. But things are more complex because uh, PFAS tend sometimes uh, to form micelles uh, which makes the pore size and structure of the adsorbent also influential on the, uh, the adsorption process. So when I started that work, I was very interested uh, in the studies that they claim to be removing PFAS selectively, uh, whatever that means. Uh, so I started to collect these in, in, in one table. Um, actually, the table is it's much, much longer, and I promise I will not go through these one by one. Uh, because I simply summarized uh, this all in, in, in one um, review paper here at ESNT Letters that I, I observed that the common link among all studies that they claim that they have selective removal of PFAS is that they would have amine functionality in, in, in them. So different amine functional groups uh, were used from primary being the most commonly used and others uh, in different studies. Uh, but as an engineer, I also want to know how did they test it. So most studies I observed that they just put it in DDI, distal deionized water or millicule water, pure water without any competition. And very few studies challenge the, the material to test them again is like background constituents, like they tested in surface water, groundwater, wastewater, uh, and real like AFFF impacted water, and some NOM solution, which is like natural organic matter. And another observation that most of these studies were tested in batch scale, uh, batch mode, um, and only three uh, at that point when I when I reviewed it, it was uh, using column studies. I don't even think that there are many more uh, over the past two years. So another key observation, as I highlighted earlier, that is a general thing about treatment of PFAS work is that most of the studies, you would find them in unrealistic conditions, like uh, up to one gram per liter, which in, in real scenario, uh, environmentally relevant condition is just like in this scale and one study or few studies has tested uh, their materials in, in, in such range. So the simple question that will come to you, okay, why are aminated uh, adsorbents are efficient for PFAS? So the answer that we could conclude in from all of these studies that you would have an interplay uh, among three main factors that you would need to balance in your material. The first one is electrostatic interaction, hydrophobic interaction, and the third is the pore size. And then simple question comes is, do you have evidence for that? So I'll try to give you like not all the studies, but what most studies agreed upon. Uh, so this is, this is my work uh, that I observed that electrostatic interaction are very much necessary. Like when I prepared the CMC uh, cellulose microcrystal, so I functionalized with polyethylene amine. Uh, so you have like a mixture of primary, secondary, tertiary amine. Uh, so the simple observation that we saw that 
uh, during the preparation, if you have the cellulose microcrystal as, as it is, there is no removal of PFAS. As part of the preparation, we oxidize it, still no removal. But once the amine functionality is um, installed there, then PFAS is, is removed. And that was also confirmed that since you have like primary, secondary, tertiary amine, they would be, they have different protonation state uh, depending on the water pH. Uh, and that was also very much uh, reasonable that if you have a higher pH, the, the, the removal would be decreasing. So this also confirmed that electrostatic interaction is very much needed. Uh, in the same study, uh, we could also observe that not only electrostatic but hydrophobic interactions are uh, necessary. So I screened the same material for a wide range of PFAS and the C number here just represent the chain length. So carbon four all the way to carbon 13. So if you have shorter chain PFAS, this is more hydrophilic. And if you have longer chain PFAS, this is more hydrophobic. So from the selectivity point of view, the solid bar tells you that uh, this is the experiment in DDI, while the dash is the same experimental setup, uh, but in lake water. So from selectivity point of view, it's very selective, but it is dependent on the chain length, which is very much translated to the uh, conclusion that hydrophobic interaction is uh, dominating the, the removal here. The third evidence about the pore size came from a more precise uh, or uh, uh, the material that you can uh, precisely control in terms of its pore size is a study that tested the effect of pore size on, of metal organic framework on the PFA, PFOA uh, specifically removal. So the, the, in, in such material, you can design the pore size uh, and where you can uh, install the amine functionality. So to give you in a nutshell what has been observed here, that when they placed the amine functionality in a pore size that is smaller than the PFOA molecule. Uh, so you have amine, so people would think that, okay, then this would be selective for PFAS, but that was not the case. Since the pore size was smaller and the amine is hiding inside that pore, the PFOA was not removed at all. So that confirmed for us that this is the, the conclusion that I shared with you earlier that you would need to balance three different factors uh, in order to remove PFAS efficiently and selectively. So the next question that, okay, you have tons of different adsorbents out there, different studies claiming to be uh, PFAS selective. Uh, what is the best uh, adsorbent uh, for PFAS now? So I would say Dexorb. What is Dexorb? It's a commercial material by Cyclopure. What is Cyclopure? I will take you in a journey to answer how and why did we get here? So this journey, will, I will walk you through different studies that has been published over the past three years, either in our group in Clemson or uh, the Dictel group at Northwestern, which is in part now, uh, in collaboration with the Helpwing group at uh, Cornell. So the first study that I want to share with you, is not an aminated adsorbent, but that was the first work that you see for PFAS removal that it shows selective removal of PFOA in the presence of humic acids as a natural organic matter surrogates. But the good thing that they started to touch is that they test the material at low concentration, one microgram per liter as uh, initial concentration that was the lowest tested at that time and with low absorbent dose. But the shortcoming of, of that specific study that the removal was pretty slow, if you notice here. Uh, so it was okay if you have a 200 milligram per, a microgram per liter as initial concentration of PFOA, but once you drop it to more realistic um, condition of one microgram per liter, yeah, after 24 hours, you reach equilibrium and you catch up in, in terms of the removal efficiency, but again, it's slow. Uh, and the monomers used in that specific polymer were very expensive. Uh, and again, we couldn't get much insights about like, what are the contributing uh, factors? Is it hydrophobic, electrostatic whatsoever here? It's, we couldn't get that sense because it was tested only with PFOA. 
on, on parallel to that, I was working on the study that I shared earlier with you that I was preparing that cellulose microcrystal uh, functionalized with, with polyethylene amine. And that was very intriguing result to see. I even like suspecting myself tons of time, maybe I'm doing something wrong with the uh, analysis, but it was true that at one microgram per liter, within minutes you reach equilibrium and you get rid of, of PFAS regardless of the initial concentration. Uh, that was screened for 22 different PFAS, but again, as I explained earlier, that was uh, uh, correlating here the removal with, with the uh, uh, chain length of, of, of the PFAS that were tested. Uh, so the hydrophobic interaction was uh, dominant here. That's why it didn't, it worked well for long chain PFAS, but didn't work that well for shorter chain PFAS. But we were learning, uh, that, that's the learning process. That's why I'm working through uh, this like fundamental work and that led us to, to get more understanding to optimize the best adsorbent. So the next study came again from the Big Tail group shortly after the previous one, um, but that was a covalent organic framework. So the, the amazing thing about that class of material that again, you can precisely control the design of the material and you can precisely load different amine uh, functionality in, it to, in, in order to understand what, which is the optimum condition for, for that. So there is no surprise there. It's an aminated adsorbent very fast removal of th 13 different PFAS, regardless of their uh, chain length. Uh, of course, shorter chain, a little bit uh, lower, but that's, that's an amazing result to see uh, with again, low adsorbent dose. Uh, but the, the, however, that we have here that the, once you extend the, the equilibrium time, I observed that it's, it's removed, uh, the, you have like low stability in the adsorption. So you would see desorption back, especially for shorter chain PFAS. Uh, and since this experiment is uh, run as mixture, so I suspect that there are actually some competition among PFAS themselves, like they would go and replace uh, shorter chain PFAS, but that was not really confirmed. But uh, from an engineering perspective, the synthesis of a covalent organic framework, it's still like lab scale, not really scalable for, for an adsorbent. But what we could learn from such uh, amazing study is that uh, we, when we precisely control the amine uh, loading, you can see that you would have an optimal condition. It's not like you keep adding amine and it will remove more. No, like it, the study suggests like if you have 20% of that amine loading, this is where the optimal condition is. If you add more, the, the, the removal efficiency uh, goes down. So that was very insightful in terms of like our fundamental understanding of, of such systems. Uh, shortly after I was on parallel working on another uh, material, uh, which is a cationic hydrogel. Uh, it's, it's very easy to prepare just like radical polymerization uh, and in like mild temperature and short time. So you'll get like a gel slab that you can just pulverize it and you get an adsorbent. So the good thing about that, it's again, besides the uh, selectivity and the high uh, removal that I tested that in, in lake water, uh, that's the light blue, the dark blue, that's uh, river water and the red here, that's a uh, treated wastewater effluent. So short chain, long chain, uh, 24 hours, there is no desorption. So it's stable removal and at the same time selective. So when you compare to the solid bar, which is a DDI, uh, that's, that's very good uh, result to see from, from a selectivity point of view. But the simple, however, that I have there that, okay, how can we uh, uh, apply this? So the adsorbent morphology at that point uh, needs further optimization. I didn't work more on that because I moved to the new position, uh, but I have ideas that we can take this uh, further. Uh, the very good result that came almost in, in, in the same 
uh, time uh, frame came from the Bechtel group again with a, a cyclodextrin polymer that's I mean, uh, again with amine functional uh, groups. Uh, so testing it at environmentally relevant condition and you go below the US EPA healthy advisory limit, uh, short chain, long chain PFAS, it is equally uh, or almost equally removed uh, selectively from, from that at low absorbent dose, but expensive monomer. Um, so can we replace that monomer? Another uh, postdoc at, at the Dictel group, Anna Yang, she, she tested different monomers as, as um, alternative monomers for that to cross-link the, the, the polymer here with varying um, degree of, of success. Here, when comes the Dixorb. So, in parallel to all of that academic research, uh, there has been a company, uh, Cyclopure, that it's been act out actually out of, from Dictel Group when they were at uh, Cornell. So, it's uh, developing cyclodextrin polymers and very heavily investing uh, recently in, in the PFAS uh, research. So, they took what, the, what we uh, used to see just in the lab in a small scale now they can prepare large scale uh, KG of, of this polymer and it is very selective for, for PFAS. And part of my role here actually at Northwestern started like by supporting the R&D department there at Cyclopure to help them finding solution for PFAS treatment uh, to degrade PFAS. Uh, there are so many uh, projects that they are uh, working throughout the, throughout the US and also in Europe like wastewater treatment plants in uh, Netherlands and Finland and Germany. So when I said the absorb is, is the best, uh, I guess the last time I gave that lecture, uh, these studies were not out, but these two study that, that this one and the next one came uh, uh, around December last year, uh, where they compare uh, side by side, if you have like the absorb that's uh, non PFAS selective uh, material, uh, and then compare it to cationic exchange resin that's commercially available, Dexor Plus that's for PFAS. I mean, CDP, that's another class of material that come from out from the Dictel group as a, as a benchmark to compare an online exchange resin, which is conventionally used for, for PFAS. So I'll not go detailed in, in all of those points here, but take home message, Dexor Plus and Dexor showed the best removal for a wide range of PFAS like anionic, non-anionic and deuteronic PFAS. And that was confirmed uh, in the follow-up study where they took like uh, AFFF impacted groundwater and did like uh, target and non-target screening uh, for different PFAS. And as you notice here for different material, uh, Dixor Plus is, is sitting in, in on top uh, regardless of, of uh, the PFAS targeted there. So on a, on a flow through system, like uh, these studies uh, uh, by Cyclopure, this is an unpublished work. Uh, so they compare the removal of, of different PFAS in, in an RSCCT uh, setup, like column uh, uh, setup. Uh, and you can see like the breakthrough is coming very, very late. And to confirm that you would benchmark that again is carbon. Uh, I believe GAC1 is F400 and GAC2 another carbon that claim to be uh, the best for, for PFAS. But the thing that you need to notice here that they were tested at different like empty bed contact time. So the carbon were at longer empty bed contact time and the polymer was at much shorter empty bed con contact time. But regardless of that, uh, the comparison is it's just like, it's talk for itself. Like activated carbon, the breakthrough comes way, way earlier uh, when compared uh, to these new polymers. And after these RSCC studies, uh, actually in Orange County, there is since more than a year now or more than a year and a half, uh, there is a pilot scale uh, system that compare the, the material uh, for, for longer term evaluation. Uh, under realistic condition. So 
back to that slide, I, I guess uh, I tried to convince you today that the, the efforts has been very intense over the past few years, uh, trying to push these polymers to, to compete uh, with these conventional uh, absorbents. Uh, in, in, in my like interdisciplinary approach uh, of, of doing research, I'm an engineer and also having some chemistry work, I, I shared like best practices for evaluating these new absorbents uh, for water treatment technologies because of some flows that I could observe either uh, from an engineer that deal with a new polymer as a black box and not really understanding what's happening there or a chemist that underestimating how rigorous that you need to run uh, adsorption system in order to verify whether it is really effective or no. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested, you can check check this uh, perspective that we published recently. So to conclude, uh, did we solve the problem? I would say only partially. We, we are still like in the middle of a mess out there. So most of the efforts, uh, except for the recent two study that I showed, like most of the efforts uh, in, in the research were on anionic PFAS. But the PFAS family is a very strong, diverse uh, family of chemicals that you would have like anionic, non-anionic, cationic, zeteronic PFAS. They would need much more efforts in order to come with confidence and say like, okay, now we are closer to solve this. And as I mean, like, I, I think I took the screenshot from the EPA back in November, I believe. And I believe the number of fluorinated chemicals should be like going up because two months before that, it was around 6,000. And I don't know how much it is now, but we are talking about like almost 10,000 chemicals out there. And after separating them, we need to destroy them. So what's next? I, I put here just mainly the general challenges uh, that we are facing currently. Uh, so we need to have efficient degradation of short chain PFAS. Uh, these are the replacement of long or legacy PFAS that they used to be uh, in the market, but now people in the industry trying to convince us that short chain PFAS is better for you, but it's not really the case. So we need to find a degradation method for this. And not only degradation that at high concentration, but we need degradation at realistic condition uh, in terms of concentration and the background constituents. And specific scenarios uh, where you need to degrade PFAS in regeneration solution, that's a, a very uh, big area of research that needs much more efforts. Uh, degradation of PFAS in AFFF contaminated waters in pilot scale, I guess most of the work is still now in humble uh, lab scale research. And to answer the question, uh, what is the optimum tre treatment range? I guess we will need to invest much more uh, efforts to answer these uh, previous questions. So I, I did over the past one and a half year, a lot of degradation work. I don't have the permission to uh, share this yet because like uh, some IP issue that it is being filed and stuff, but hopefully soon uh, we will be able to share our efforts here. Uh, but the thing that to conclude to say here that the advantage of having um, selective removal of PFAS uh, without any effect of background constituents of natural organic, organic matter whatsoever, that now we are able to having a neat PFAS solution that you can simply evaporate the solvent and you get the salt that we are applying new uh, uh, technologies for total destruction and safe dip disposal of whatever remains. With that, I would uh, thank my current lab, my previous uh, collaborators that made that possible. And I would thank you for attending the talk today and I will be more than happy to take any questions.